This is episode 125 of the XY podcast with Peter Layla. The topic of technology is a super interesting one within the Facebook group, as there still seems to be some who wonder if tech will one day completely take over their role as an advisor. When asked whether technology will enable or challenge what advisors do and how they service their clients, Peter Layla, CEO of Money Brilliant, sums it up brilliantly when he says tech will no doubt change what advisors do, but this change will also bring with it fantastic opportunities. So if technology can be an enabler for advisors, how can we make sure we're utilizing a suite of tech products which best complements our unique value propositions? This episode is for the advisor who wants to better understand the opportunities tech presents and how it can be used to give a sophisticated and intelligent client experience. Peter and Adrian also open up the conversation around open banking, the consumer data right, and how tech is working hard to do the heavy lifting for advisors and consumers. Peter also gives us an insight into how he teamed his professional career in financial services with his love for tech and how Money Brilliant is working with advisors to deliver great client outcomes. We hope you get plenty of takeaways from this episode. And as always, if there's anything we can be doing to make your podcast experience even better, please feel free to reach out at xyadvisor.com. This podcast is brought to you by Salesforce, blaze new trails to richer client relationships with the world's number one CRM. Salesforce has designed the Financial Services Cloud to help you make every interaction personalized through rich client profiles centered on personal goals and pivotal life events. You can nurture deeper relationships with proactive tracking and event alerts that remind you to reach out when clients need you the most. Supercharge your productivity by managing client engagements, household relationships, and financial life goals all from the one connected platform. It's the world's number one CRM imagined just for wealth management. Salesforce is excited to partner with XY Advisor to discuss how you can build richer client relationships and unlock loyalty. Hub24 is an ASX listed company with over $10 billion funds under management and one of the fastest growing platforms in the market. Neither a bank nor part of a bank, Hub24 focuses entirely on connecting advisors to a broad range of investment solutions for their clients. Discover why other advisors think Hub24 are the best in the market and access the benefits of choice and efficiency for you and your clients with their market leading managed portfolio solution. To find out more, visit hub24.com.au. Good morning, Peter. Hi, Adrian. Great to have you on the podcast. This is a it's the first time. It is. It is. Yeah, we've we've caught up a few times before and talked all good things about tech. And looking forward to going into things a bit more today. I guess um, to start off with, but Peter, anyone that doesn't know Peter, he's from Money Brilliant. So it's one of those the personal financial management apps. Is Correct. That, yeah. That's how you call yep. it. Yep. Yep. Exactly get, right. Get exactly. the lingo right. Um, so the likes of My Prosperity and uh, MoneySoft, etc. So. Peter's, Peter's got money brilliant. That's way better than all of them. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> You said it, Adrian. Well, that's what we'll, we'll see. We'll have to chat about it a bit sure. later on. But um, yeah, thanks for coming on. What's, what's, what have you been working on lately? What's, what's the coolest thing you've been doing more recently? Uh, look, there's a, there's a couple of things we've been working on, I guess, to sort of differentiate what we do from you know, the competitors that you've talked about, which are all really good products as well. Um, I guess for us, the big focus is moving from a traditional personal financial management app that focuses on sort of budgeting and spending analysis, but largely looks back or backward um, to a building an app, which is a more proactive and better able to help customers make decisions about how they're going to spend their money in the future, which we think is far more interesting and far more valuable. So is that the, so the analytics? And Yeah, correct. So, you know, there's a whole bunch of things, I think, um, that are creating opportunities in this area at the moment. So you've got analytic capabilities, artificial intelligence capabilities, big data, open banking, the consumer data right, which is, um, which is coming. Um, you know, general improvements in mobile technology. So the fact that you can do all of this sort of stuff mm. for a customer now on their phone, I think, has created a whole bunch of new, really exciting opportunities as well. So that's the that's the sort just of space a of things that we to talk play. about. Yeah, <laughs> and you know, I mean, just to just to bring it to life for you, I guess um, fairly recently, some of the really positive feedback we've had from one nice little feature that we've added into the app is um, we can now use live feeds of petrol price data to yeah. actually send people push alerts to their phones when petrol prices are at the bottom of the price cycle in the area that they live in and tell them which petrol station in their area has the cheapest petrol 
and tell them to fill their car up at that point. So, Very you know, cool. they're saving, I don't know, $20, maybe $30 by buying their petrol at the bottom of the price cycle rather than at the top of the price cycle. Yeah, totally. Um, so that's just one example, I guess, is uh, about how we can use data, mobile computing, um, analytics and so on to deliver real practical money saving opportunities to customers at that point in time exactly right yeah, yeah, exactly right because yeah. that's what it's all about you know mm. i think i think giving people um you know advice in any form really at the wrong point in time is you know more or less useless there is this sort of element i think of, of timing and timeliness which is really important i think a lot of the problem people have had with personal money apps is that great you're tracking it great yep. And, and, and it'll improve the, the meeting when you catch up um, once a year, but what more can you do for me? That's, that's that sort of like, it's great. We, we, we got better at looking at what happened now. That's, yeah. that's good. Yeah. Tick, which is great. That's yeah. a huge move of the yeah. dial compared to having to ask the client. Correct. Yep. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's really this, this proactive space, I think, is that's where all the value is going to really start to accelerate. Yeah, you're exactly right in the sense that... Um, you know, people only get a certain amount of value and only maintain a, their interest for a certain amount of time if it's really just about showing them what they've done in the past. Mm. And I think you know a lot of PFM apps have um, relied on you know nudging customers or, or helping customers understand what they've been doing in the past in the hope that somehow they'll figure out you know, what they can do better or more effectively in the future, but largely by themselves. And so what we're trying to do is make the jump from that sort of historical analysis mm. into actually giving people um, help in making those decisions about what they do, what they do in the future. So the petrol price um, alerts is one example. We've done a whole bunch of others as well, um, focused on either insights. Um, and so for us, that involves automatically analyzing a customer's transactional data um, to try and find ways to to save them money mm. um, or by um, analyzing products and services that they use and finding them um, cheaper better alternatives and so some of the examples of insights that we've given for people particularly relevant I guess if you live in New South Wales you know there's things like the New South Wales government um, active kids program and creative kids programs where if you've got school-aged kids and you've enrolled them in sporting activities or creative activities, the government will give you a $100 refund on the expenses that you've incurred in those sort of activities for your kids. Okay. And so, you know, if you're across all of these things, I guess you already know about it. You've perhaps already claimed your $100. But, you know, what we find is most people don't have time to stay across all of these things. So what we can do is we can, um, I guess, connect the, the knowledge that we've created about these sort of opportunities or offers that exist in the market um, and a customer's data and then target the right offer to the right person, hopefully at the right time to make sure that people do actually claim their, you know, their hundred dollar um, refund from the New South Wales government. So that's an example of a so helping nudging that, um, the outcome a bit more. Yeah. And you know, we always also try to make it as easy as possible for them to claim it as well. So we'll try and package up that insight be the in a way really the simple step. way that, yeah, just helps them actually, you know, do whatever it is that they need to do to actually get their, um, get, you know, execute the offer or, yeah, totally. or claim the offer. Um, and then there's a, a bunch of products and services that we evaluate for people as well. So um, when a customer signs up to Money Brilliant uh, and they connect their bank accounts, um, credit cards and loans and so on to Money Brilliant, we'll automatically now analyze their transaction accounts, savings accounts, credit cards, uh, and they can also um, do gas bills and electricity bills and we'll analyze all of those products for them compare them to all of the other products available in the market come back to them and actually give them suggestions about how they could save money by switching to cheaper products and also try and quantify for them how much we think they'd save as well yeah, yeah. so you know if you um, if you happen to be on the or using the wrong credit card we'll actually find um, the paying, cheapest credit cards for you. For example. Yeah, exactly right. You know, so if you're if you're carrying a balance forward each month and you're on a high interest rate credit card, chances are you'd save money by switching to a lower rate credit card. Mm. And we'll actually find those lower rate credit cards for you, quantify the, the saving opportunity, make it really clear, and push that back to you. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah so yeah. credit cards are a good example. Um, and we do that based on the customer's actual transaction history and the usage of their credit card. So it comes down to 
um, you know, the balance they carry forward, the types of transactions that they actually use the card for. So if you're a frequent overseas uh, traveller, you know, that'll actually suggest a different credit card to somebody who perhaps uses their credit card in Australia just because of the foreign currency costs mm -hmm. and overseas transaction costs. Um, but with, like, how did you get into this? Like, like obviously, I don't know, it's pretty cool where you've landed. Like, yep. it must be pretty exciting. How, yeah. did you, how did you get on this path to where you are now? That's a good question. Um, I wonder sometimes, actually. Because <laughs> uh, I, mean, I can't imagine you were five years ago going, I want everything to look exactly how it is looking now. <laughs> um, no, 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 I think I've had a, um, I've had a, a sort of interest in technology since I was a kid, really. So I've always found technology interesting, and I, I guess I've always had a pretty good understanding of technology. And as I, as I started to build a career, what I found most interesting, I guess, was operating at the, the interface between business or business strategy and technology. So, what fascinates me is using technology to either create new business opportunities. Uh, and I think fundamentally technology does create new business opportunities. You know, it allows us to do things that we've never done before, or we can use technology to solve existing business problems or challenges as well. Was so, it more of a practice? Did you start with a strong tech or was it like, I, I see the problem, I'm going to figure this out? So, no, no, I, I started on the business side. So, um, you know, my, my background is, is actually economics and accounting. Okay. Um, so, you know, I started working in a chartered accounting firm when I left um, when I left high school. I did an economics degree. I did my professional year with the Institute of Chartered Accountants. Um, but I was really fortunate in the accounting firm that I was working in. They had a technology consulting division. And so I moved into that technology consulting division pretty quickly. Um, and initially I was providing consulting services to... Um, account, other accounting firms and then to professional services firms and then I went to PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, in the financial services uh, division of the management consulting business at PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, and again I was sort of using technology to solve business problems so it was in the early days of data warehousing, uh, analytics yep. and so we were using data warehousing to help banks understand things like customer profitability and customer transactional behaviour uh, and then to help them build marketing strategies that were more effective based on the real use of data. So, I, you know, I find that that sort of intersection between business and technology fascinating. Oh, it um, is. Like, so technology is almost the answer for every business problem these days. Well, it can be, you know, it absolutely can be. And, um, you know, I think that's really interesting. And then I think what's really exciting is the fact that, you know, technology helps us uh, or allows us to solve problems that, you know, we, we don't even recognise today. You know, mm. that's the opportunity side, I guess, of I think the, the technology. When you're talking about these analytics, and like I love the concept of all this stuff because it is is really edging into, um, I guess that you, you, you're experimenting. Yeah, like it's it allows you having the data allows you to experiment cheaply, I guess, on what's going to be valuable and yeah. and get that identified quite quickly. Yeah. I guess is yeah. that. Is that fair to say? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that's one of the really exciting things about working in a startup business like Money Brilliant. We're, we're nimble, we're agile, um, and we can actually try things. You know, we've got a great, um, a great customer base now that's really receptive to, to new ideas. We get great feedback from, from customers. Uh, and we can evolve what we're doing really quickly as well. So, so do you do like A/B testing? I guess for people out there, that's where you um, where you might give a certain design of a new feature to one segment, and a different design to another segment, and see how people react to it. Is that yeah, I mean, in a, in a, um, I guess conceptually we would do that. Um, probably not as formalised as okay. a as a <clears throat> excuse me as a bigger uh, as a bigger company, but we would definitely build a new feature um, in the product, make that available to a, a small group of customers. Um, even internally, actually, to start mm. with, just among just our own staff. staff. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. I mean, we get great feedback even from our from our own staff um, in the early stages of developing a new feature. So is it a bit like like Facebook without the break things? So try new things and break things is Facebook's thing. You're, you're like, we'll try new things, but I don't necessarily want to break things. So. Oh, I mean... <laughs> You know, I understand the concept of breaking things, but and you know, breaking breaking things quickly, and you know, absolutely, if we're gonna if we're gonna do something and we get it um, wrong, we want to get it wrong really quickly and mm. learn from that and move on. But you know, by design, we want to try and get it right and get it right yeah, the first totally. time as well. Um, 
And is there, I guess, like this is what we're sort of getting into is startup methodology and yep. sort of how do you validate concepts and ideas? And yep. obviously you're saying that there's your, your internal um, internal staff, you then got a smaller cohort. Yep. And then if that proves to be a success, then you can roll it out to the broader business. Yeah, and is absolutely. That, yeah. That's pretty standard sort of flow. That you yeah, can, yeah. It's, it, it is pretty standard and it works pretty well, I think, with the technologies that we we use today. Um, we also work pretty closely with a with a group of advisors who, you know, we can actually um, have whiteboard sessions or design things on paper, you know, with wireframe pictures and so on of, of what we're planning to build and get really good insights back from them in the early stages of development as well. So, you know, we, we limit the, op- or the, the chances that we actually, you know, build something in its entirety, get it to market mm. and then find that it you know, it's not fit I'll build, build Rome and they'll come. Yeah, something. exactly right. I mean, it's such, it works. such an With old tech. way of thinking yeah. now. Um, and, you know, we, we're building in, in, um, in two-week development sprints as well. So, you know, we're, we're continually awesome. trying to build a new feature, a new set of features um, within a two-week development sprint and then getting that to market. So we don't always achieve that. You know, we might get to the end of the development sprint and, and, the next and it might not be ready for, for deployment. Um, so it might take us a couple of sprints to actually get it to market, but where we can, yeah, we're deploying at the end of two weeks. And by using the word sprint, I'm presuming there's a scrum methodology, yeah, um, yep. Yep. which for for those out there, um, yeah, scrums are, uh, or an agile framework it might be yep. called. Yep. Um, as Peter said, it's a two, they're using a two week cycle. It's, it's, so it's usually a, like a, a short term period. Yep. So I don't know what the ranges are, but depending on the business, they'll set it as, but usually under a month, I guess. Yeah, sort of yeah I mean, the shorter, the better, really. Mm. Um, there's some practical limits, I think, around just how short it, 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 it can be, and two weeks seems to work pretty well for us. But it's a, you know, for me, it's um, it's a philosophy that you can use for anything. You know, it's mm. not just about tech development. I think you could use it for, for, for anything. The core principles, I think, are just as applicable to you know, marketing or client management or, you know, advice process development or anything like that. Absolutely. Um, the more, the more I've gotten into tech over time, the more and learned more about Scrum. Yeah. The more of like, wow, maybe this is just actually a smart way of doing things. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know. Yeah. It's not... uh, absolutely. <laughs> like if you get the opportunity, pick up a, pick up a book and have a quick read about, you know, agile development or, or scrum um, absolutely because you'll learn a lot just even ways of prioritization yeah correct mm. you know and you, and i often think with these sorts of things you, know, you don't want to become a religious sort of fanatic about a particular methodology but there's there's lots of little principles or principles i guess that you can pick up out of these sorts of things that you can take forward yeah i've talked to i've talked to scrum masters and they can be a bit zealous a yeah. bit of a zealot around it but i think um generally most people you talk to that aren't as uh, much of a zealot they they appreciate the benefits it, yeah. it brings to, like, if you just look at project management, like as a historically how it's gone on in larger institutions and just smaller institutions, it's yeah. it's fraught with stress and <laughs> like pain that this sort of thinking um, alleviates a bit. And it's saying that you don't know what the outcome is going to be. Yeah, you can have a general concept. And yeah. you can have a you can have a good strategy about where you want to go, but your clients and what's possible in terms of if you're experimenting and designing new things, that's going to guide you until you shape the journey. Yeah. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's interesting. So, um, so Peter, in terms of, I guess, where, like, obviously you can see things going down the analytics space. Is there any sort of, if we look at, um, open banking, for example, yep. coming in. Yep. Like you guys get your data feeds, you're beholden to, is it Yodley that you're using? Yeah, we use Yodley. Obviously, for, um, you guys would have gone really good at cleaning up what they throw at you. Um, <laughs> and like that would have been half the job at the start, I'm sure, because yep. I've heard I've heard a lot about the inconsistencies of that data that comes through. Yeah. Because for those yep. that don't know, Yodley um, is a scraping, um, I guess it pulls data from a, um, I guess a person's online login for their bank account or their credit Correct. card. Yeah. Um, and they've gotten really good at it. Yeah. Uh, but what's better than that is a direct feed from the bank. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we're on the verge of getting those. So, um, you know, I think Yodley's done a good job given the limitations that have existed in the market. Um, in <laughs> Almost Australia. like the blockers that the institutions have put yeah. for them to do it. They've always, I, I, my understanding is that some institutions have actually actively tried to Stop yeah, we've not had that experience, but I, I've certainly heard of others that, that 
that think that that's the case. Um, but you know, the the exciting thing is we're on the verge now. I think of a new era where um, you know banks will have to actually provide um, open access to customers' data. You know, it'll be authorized and it'll be secure and all those sorts of good things as well. So this is not a you know a free for all in terms mm -hmm. of using people's data. Far from it. Um, but the you know, the big benefit is there'll be some standardization around how that um, that access is provided. There'll be some standardization of the data. I still think there'll be a lot of data issues that people probably haven't anticipated, but there'll be some standardization around mm -hmm. that. Um, and so, you know, theoretically, it should be easier to actually get a customer's data and use a customer's data for the sorts of things that, um, that Money Brilliant does. But what's, I think, even more exciting about that is, unlike other, um, countries, what, what Australia's done is actually built a really comprehensive framework around um, customer data, or they're in the process of building a really comprehensive framework around data called the consumer data right. Okay. And the principles of consumer data right basically are that, you know, a customer should be able to direct an, an institution that holds personal data about them that's been built up through a customer's interactions with that company to a third party. Mm. So it's not just about open banking. Open banking or the banking industry, I guess, is the first um, first industry to be subject to this. But the government's already flagged energy as another industry that mm. will come into the consumer data right framework. They've flagged telecommunications as an yeah. industry that will come into it. And it's you can see this more rolling robust, out. Sort yeah. of. So but that'll start to create some really exciting opportunities um, some of which we're already doing. So I said earlier that you know we optimize or we will optimize a customer's electricity bills and gas bills for them to find ways of them saving money. And on average, actually, we save um, customers who use that service about six hundred dollars a year in energy costs. So there's a big opportunity for customers in that sort of area. So we do some of that today, but it should get easier to do it mm -hmm. in the future because what you'll be able to do is aggregate data not just from banking but from things like energy and telecommunications and you know potentially insurance and health insurance and grocery data and you know any number of different sort of sources of data to actually use that data for for the good of the the customer mm, whatever that so is yeah it's really exciting i think it, my understanding is that you'd be able to then make um instead of just identifying things you'd actually be able to trigger a direct transaction as well as that well, I mean, that's not part of the, the, the current rollout. consumer data right um, framework, but yeah, I mean, so you, you would act, you could actually we'll be go. a replacement for a bank app, essentially. Yeah, in the yeah. longer is yeah. that yeah, exactly right. So what, I mean, the, the government one of the government's intentions around the consumer data right was to actually encourage switching behaviour from you know large incumbent organisations that are inefficient and sort of have high prices to you know, nimbler, cheaper, more cost-effective solutions for consumers. So you think about banking, it should increase competition in banking. If you think about energy, which has been a big problem area for consumers in Australia, it should increase competition in, in energy and telecommunications and so on. And if you think through where we are with the consumer data right at the moment, being able to access the data and analyze the data and find cheaper or better alternatives for a customer is sort of the first step. Mm. But to actually get the switching behavior, you actually need to make it easier to switch, I think, mm. as well. Because we, you know, we would we would suggest to consumers every day or customers every day um, cheaper alternatives for their credit card savings accounts, transaction accounts, gas bills, electricity bills. But I know that not every one of those customers actually makes the switch mm. because of the, well, the next cost steps are, in, in, in doing it. Not the financial cost, but the time, the time and effort and cost. It, yeah, because they and don't so, make it frictionless to do it. No, of course not. And so, you know, what you'd expect, I guess, is after this first phase of the consumer data rights that rolls out, that the government will either um, legislate to make it easier to switch mm -hmm. or market forces will make it easier to switch. Mm -hmm. And I, I think market forces will start to come into play because you'll have smaller organizations i think that are hungry to grow who will start to say well, well engage with it yeah if money if people like money brilliant have all of the data to be able to find the cheapest electricity plan for a customer and i can plug my apis into something like money brilliant to allow customers to electronically switch mm. then i'll pick up business from people who exactly exactly right it's an incentive so, for whoever's got a better deal exactly or right who's exactly offering right. a good product yeah, yeah. Exactly right. So, you know, I think it'll get easier despite the fact that at the moment that switching case is the, the blockers that are the, there. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting the, the, the 
the tension between mandating things and the market forces is like it's 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 almost like a little bit of pick your battle sort of thing. It's uh, what's going to have the biggest effect, and and I guess it sounds like as, as long as you're creating the environment with this standardization, which is always a big thing in tech. I think the standardization yeah. of data and interaction between businesses yeah. is huge. It yeah. what it's what makes most of the tech in the world operate and. Um, like if you just think like the web itself, yeah. that's an agreement on protocols and yeah. how how the internet functions. Yeah, and people have been able to once that was agreed, it then created because everyone was working on the same thing. Yeah, 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 I agree. I think um, I think every now and then, you know, you need to you need to give markets a bit of a nudge to actually get something happening, and then um, you know, markets themselves, I think, start to build some momentum and and things start to happen. And I think the consumer data right is is probably a good example, actually, where the government's given things a bit of a nudge, and now hopefully, industry and businesses will pick that up and actually run, and actually run with it. When you've got all the neo banks as well, they're coming. Yeah, in. exactly right. I mean, it creates great opportunities for them. Um, and you know, I think the other thing that's interesting that perhaps people haven't sort of realised is it's not just a banking um, issue or financial services issue either. You know, I think there's a lot of people in financial services thinking this is really exciting because now we can we'll be able to provide additional services to clients we'll be able to use their data for analytics and make better but there'll be people in other industries who will be just as capable of doing that as well exactly right so you know if you're a Qantas yeah exactly right so if you're somebody in any, any industry really that has a large number of customer relationships and a trusted relationship with those customers I'd argue that you'll be in a position, given the consumer data right, to actually make offers in all sorts of different areas to that customer. Mm. Um, and fundamentally, it'll come back to who actually has the most trusted relationship with the client and who does the customer We're actually solving think. more problems. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that's a big part of the money brilliant business as well because, you know, we're, we're trying to build a business built around customer advocacy. So when we, when we actually analyze a customer's credit cards, savings accounts, transaction accounts, gas, uh, gas accounts, bill, um, electricity accounts, you know, we're doing that um, completely unbiased. We try to analyze every single product or service available in the market and give the customer the best suggestion we can possibly give them. Mm. So you know, we're, we're trying to build a business that's built around being a champion of the customer and a true customer advocate. Yeah. Full transparency. Yeah, exactly right. And I think that's the sort of that's another one of the opportunities I think mm. that's created by this sort of consumer data right and the the evolution of a sort of data economy as mm. well. You can start to do things like well, that. I can imagine there's a constant challenge from for a business like yours that because the, the standard challenge that comes up in these sort of businesses is is to actually um, work with particular providers and start to <laughs> yeah. Like your 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 a lot of your interactions, I'm sure, with opportunities with partners, yep. would be looking for exclusivity and things like that. And that and I, and I don't, yeah, um, yeah, I, I can imagine so. they're tough conversations they because are. I guess holding on to those principles in the face of immediate um, sort of cash benefits, so to speak. Yeah, yep. uh, it's yeah, it's it, and it's great. Like it's to see that you're able to been able to do that, um, yep. considering like and. To be fair on Vita, like they've got like a large institution as a key shareholder. We have, yeah, absolutely. So AMP has a key shareholding. Yep. yep. And for you to not have been caught up in um, challenges that larger institutions yep. then have and for them to have been good enough to sort of let you continue on your agenda, yep. I think that's it's a great outcome. Yeah, no, they've been really good. Um, they've been really good for us actually. And, you know, they, they sort of believe the – the mission that we're on about building something that's a real customer champion as well. So, you know, they see the long-term value in what we're trying to do. Just as, as long well as, as you do. don't show how people, for people who change super funds from a to another one, is that, is that <laughs> well, we haven't, we, haven't, the, we haven't really got into that space yet, yeah, but I think we have to, <laughs> you know, I think, I think we have to, um, when we get to that point, you know, I don't think you can then shy away and, and say, oh, well, you know, we're going to be a customer advocate for everything that's not important to us because mm. when it's important to us, we'll actually, you know, revert back to. Yeah, there's only one destination. No, no, I mean, that's not. Um, that's that's certainly not the direction that we 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 hope to go. You know, well, the, we, we want to stay true to The super data is getting this. more available. It is. It is, and we've actually touched a little bit on that already. We. Um, We've been know, talking uh, to the ATO at all, or. Um, no, we what what we did a little while ago was. Um, 
despite our sort of primary focus being on um, day-to-day decisions about money, you know, we have started building out into some more sort of strategic areas like planning for retirement. Um, and so we built we built into the app now a little um, retirement projection tool where we pick up a client's current superannuation account balance, and you know they give us the sorts of the usual sorts of data that you you'd plug into a retirement calculator, and we can project that out for them and then track their balance over time mm-hmm. because of the data feed that we've got from their super fund back against that projection. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and so when we built that feature, we did actually look at getting superannuation data and superannuation performance data um, to try and enhance that projection. Um, but true to our sort of agile development methodology, what we did was we sort of time boxed the development. We figured out what we could develop in a couple of sprints. We de- delivered that to market. And over time, we'll come back and continually enhance that retirement projection. Um, but you're quite right. There's a lot of superannuation data around. Uh, and, and at some point, we'll, we'll start to use that data, I think, to enhance that feature. The challenge is um, <laughs> if you can't even figure out what the fees are when you're an advisor <laughs> trying to look at a PDS or other data sources, how is your system going to be able yeah, to do yeah. it? So I'm sure there's a few. Um, yeah. The standardization of the data set needs to get clearer. Absolutely. So, but again, that's that's one of the core values that we we hold as a company as well. You know, we, we see ourselves as as doing the heavy lifting for consumers or customers so that they don't have to do it. Mm. You know, so we'll invest the advisors maybe in this case. Yeah, exactly right. And so, you know, we, we do a lot of work with advisors as well because we see, we see some great um, uh, relationships, I guess, or we just see how complementary the sort of focus on day to day decisions about money uh, with traditional financial um, advice areas. Um, and also we see an increasing number of advisors becoming more interested in helping customers with day-to-day decisions about money and cash flow and budgeting as well. So you know, we do a lot of work with um, with advisors. So yeah, absolutely. We try to do the heavy lifting with them as well. Um, and a good example would be, you know, if we bring it back to electricity and gas bills, if you live in Sydney, there are over 1,000 electricity plants that you could sign up to in Sydney. Huh. And so for us, the heavy lifting sort of aspect of that is, We've analysed those 1,000 electricity plans and figured out all the different sort of variables that drive pricing. So a customer can give us five or six data points from their electricity bill and we'll do the, I don't know, three million calculations that need to be done to figure out what the cheapest electricity plan is for a consumer. Mm. You know, that's us doing the heavy lifting for our customers to make it easy for a customer to actually make a decision. Yeah, totally. And, you know, I think eventually the same thing will be possible with superannuation. Well, health insurance, for example, exactly. just right. want to standardise the yeah. framework. So that's going to play, make it a lot easier for you guys yeah. to do Health insurance is another classic example. You know, if you talk to almost anybody in Australia about a purchasing decision that they have to make, that they don't feel confident making, health insurance would be a classic example. You know, mm. I, I don't know anybody who would be confident that they're in the best health fund or the cheapest health fund for them. Mm. Nobody. Mm. And so, you know, that's another area. And that's that's a really good, um, I guess, example of the sorts of things that we would look at. Any of those sort of areas where consumers know they have to make a decision. Um, we know they're time poor. There's lots of data. The decision's complex. We can automate that decision or at least um, automate the calculations and present that information in a way that makes it easy for a customer to make a decision. Mm. That's, that's again, a, the sort of mission, I guess, of, of Money Brilliant. That's exactly totally. what we're trying to do. Um, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And, you know, we think that's a, that's a really great proposition because um, who doesn't want, you know, an app running on their phone that's helping them make the best decisions they can make about how they spend their money? It doesn't matter whether you've got a lot of money or not much money. You know, if you can get more for your money, then that's mm. a great outcome. So we've talked a lot around, I guess, the direct value for the consumer. Yep. How, if, if advisors are sitting there going, great, clients love me. My problem at the moment is running my business and sort of uh, facilitating a lot of, like you've got all the compliance requirements and yep. things like that. Yeah. What are, how are you, because obviously you're a bit of a two-sided client, um, you're sort Correct. of supporting yep. Yep. your advisor partners and yep. you've got the direct clients that you're supporting. Yep. Um, what are some of the things that you're looking at to address like what's coming out of the Royal Commission and what's like even still the stuff that's playing through from FOFA? Yep. 
Yeah. So there's a couple of things. I mean, I think the first thing is you know, we've built the platform in a way, the Money Brilliant platform, in a way that allows advisors who want to provide their clients with budgeting and cash flow um, advice to do it through the platform. So there's lots of automation and lots of efficiencies mm -hmm. in doing that. We, you know, we've spoken on about things like data feeds, for example. So, you know, even a really simple level, the ability to actually get all that data flowing through into the platform, consolidate it all, standardize it all, um, report on it. You know, that's, that's a key advantage. I mm. think if you want to play in that sort of space, um, so there's lots of lots of automation and efficiency for advisors who who want to provide that sort of service. But then what we've also done is we've we've found lots of opportunities to actually integrate you know, what we built in that that basic set of capabilities into more traditional um, advice processes in a financial planning practice as well. So you know we um, for a while now we've had a view that Money Brilliant can't be a, a sort of an island in an advisor's office it needs to actually integrate well into the other tools the other technology platforms that advisors use so you know we've spent time integrating with things like coin we also integrate with salesforce as well quite quite closely um, and so you can build really exciting really engaging processes for customers around things like onboarding so a customer can sign up for money brilliant through the money brilliant app and we'll create a customer record for that customer that signed up to Money Brilliant in Salesforce for the advisor. So there's no rekeying of customer data into your CRM platform. The customer's actually entered it through the Money Brilliant app in a really nice, fun, engaging sort of way. Yep. When they start to connect their accounts in Money Brilliant so that they can see this complete picture of their finances, again, we'll sync that data over into the advisor's version of Salesforce. So they're building a profile of the client mm. and the client's wealth without having to collect all of that data manually and then key it into their mm. um, planning tools or their, their CRM platform themselves. And because of the updates that we do, you know, that, that picture of the client's being updated automatically mm -hmm. straight into the, the advisor's version of Salesforce. So what about some of the more dynamic data, like all the assets and liabilities. And yeah, so like we that. can collect that as well. So, um, you know, we, we connect to hundreds of different sources of data. In but what about in today. terms of playing into advisors? So if you go, if you make the assumption that advisors have to go away and use these other toolkits that mm -hmm. are more designed for them yep. um, to, to do their advice. Yep. Um, so you mean in terms of sort of pushing data yeah, into... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So... Um, you know, we're, we're sort of working with or talking with virtually all of the major providers of advice tools to be able to push data into their platforms or to help. X-Plan's got their recent RS open. Correct. Obviously, Salesforce has um, facilitated some great stuff for you there. Yep. Yep. So, you know, Salesforce is probably our integration that we're, we're sort of most... Um, most mature with, so okay. you know we've got the most capability with. But we're we're absolutely part of the Iris Open um, program, mm -hmm. and so you know we'd be hoping to deliver X Plan integration and sort of data feeds. Um, I guess bi-directional data feeds, ideally, um, mm. with X Plan before too long. So, and you know that'll be a big step forward, I think, for us and for advisors. Yeah, it's huge. It's sort of that. Um, yeah, how do you reduce the friction between like? Obviously, there's no there's no doubt that it, there's a mult, there's a variety of uh, tech um, tools that advisors need to use yep. Yep. to achieve all the outcomes that yep. their business requires. Yep. So it's about yeah, how do you reduce the friction? Yeah, that's fine. But that's what's exciting, I think, about you know today's technology world. You you can actually integrate these things. Mm. You know, sure there are there are challenges with some platforms, but those challenges I think are starting to be removed, or those barriers are starting to be removed. I think, and I think it's you know, it's really, really plausible for an advisor to be thinking, you know, I can actually go to market today and pick the best solution to solve the different business challenges and business opportunities I've actually got. So, you know, I could use Money Brilliant as my client-facing um, personal financial management app mm -hmm. and I could use, you know, Salesforce is my CRM mm -hmm. platform and I could use, you know, X-Plan or I could use Coin. I could have a, you know, a PDF signing tool. I could have an email marketing tool. You know, generally speaking, these things today can be, can be integrated pretty well. So mm. you can actually get, I think, a, a technology solution that represents the best option 
for all of the different things that you're trying to do, which, you know, 10 or 20 years ago, you couldn't do that. No way. Do you think that, do you think there's a need to, maybe is there, is there a need to come up with a financial planning data agreement framework where everyone agrees on a standardized set of data <laughs> would that make things a lot easier oh well you, you tell me you've probably got a stronger view on this than i have but it sounds like something that really i think it would be quite useful yeah. i mean and really um i guess you just need somebody to start to champion that cause and and coordinate the various parties around the cause give me some ideas peter yeah i, I think it's a really interesting <laughs> idea we could start work on it straight after the podcast yeah it's not a bad idea because it is like when you're talking about this stuff working together. Yeah. Once you start to, it's all working at, at the, like for document signing and things. Yep. And when, when there's a lower requirement of data, things are really starting to get there. Yeah. And it's great. Yeah. And you're getting some really good stuff. Yeah. But when you have some more in depth, if you want to use a certain modeling tool that needs a higher set of data. Yeah. And you want to alleviate that rekeying of information, or for example, even in the compliance framework, you think about all the rec compliance requirements. If you've got an engagement framework you want to use, yep. it's capturing certain compliance data points. Yep. If if that's not captured in the same way as where your CRM set, your CRM storing it, yep. then there's a whole lot of friction in translating it. And yeah, but I'm an I'm an optimist, you know. I think that's oh, a, I am that's too. A, that's a timing issue, you know. I mean, people will naturally, I guess, you know, solve the the simpler problems first mm. and then gradually, I guess, chip away at the big problems. Peter, I'm an impatient optimist. <laughs> so am I. So, so I'm now, optimist. Now, now that you put it like that. I suppose uh, that's always decide, uh, defines a startup um, or a, yeah, someone that goes yeah. out on a bit of a startup adventure, really. Yeah. So. But yeah, you just need a data standard for a, a financial plan. Yeah, because you guys, like you go, there's going to be an open banking framework and that's yep. going to standardize a certain segment of data. It will, yep. But and that's the depth defined, of you know, that, there's a standard. There's a standard is the depth, how deep does that go? It's pretty guess? deep, actually. Okay. Um, so, um, and, you know, the industry's been doing pretty good work um, over the last year or two, I guess, to build that out um, mm -hmm. in parallel with the legislation yep. being developed. Um, you know, it's probably not a bad example of sort of a whole agile methodology in, in progress as well, and who, who'd have thought that um, you know we'd have? What you're saying the government was operating on agile, an yeah, agile framework. Were running in parallel. It wasn't wasn't a sort of traditional waterfall style approach to development, which might have taken years. We've actually, you know, um, pushed it through pretty quickly. Um, and you know that's had some challenges. There's been some stakeholders that have been uncomfortable with the speed at which things have been moving. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think uh, overall the result will be pretty good. What do you think advisors can do to accept? Like, obviously, I think we're both in agreement that there's some so much awesome good stuff that's coming down the track. Yep. And there's a bit of, like, obviously, it's just a bit of time that has to play out to get yep. there for consumers, for advisors, for everyone yep. involved, really. Yep. Every stakeholder is going to benefit. Yes. Except for maybe incumbents that haven't um, embraced things. But that's another story. If if um, if you're talking to advisors and going, okay, well, you, if an advisor's sitting there going, why the fuck? Hurry, hurry the fuck up. <laughs> What can they do to like um, to help speed up things? Is it is it just talking to their the tech providers that they're working with? Is it is there any other what sort of or is it is it when they join our um, data financial planning data standardisation <laughs> organisation? Is that maybe how we're going to achieve this? Could be, could be. Look, it's a good question. I, you know, and there's no easy answer. I think because you know there's a lot to try and stay abreast of, and you know, advisors are busy sort of running their businesses and advising clients as well. So there's always a bit of a compromise or a trade-off, I guess, between how much time you spend researching these sorts of things versus how much time you spend actually running your business the way it is today. Mm. I'd say the key, though, is to make sure that you're as clear as you can be on what the challenges are that you have in your business today and also what opportunities you see in the market today so if you could sort of prioritize those so that when things come across your desk when you read things when you're talking to people you've got a pretty good idea of you know what things you should pay attention to because you know what things are likely to solve those biggest challenges or sort of provide for the biggest opportunities that you can see in the market then you can focus your time and effort on the, on those things you know, i think it's too much going on to, it is easy to get distracted. everything 
Um, There's a lot of cool stuff to get distracted there by. There is, there is. And it's easy to get distracted by things. You've you got know? Peter rocking up on your doorstep telling you all this cool stuff he's doing. But if you haven't thought about what's important to you, then he could you don't distract know, you. You don't know what to pay attention to, you know, and, and, and you don't have time, I think, to, to look at everything. Um, and, you know, there's, there'll be a lot of tech things that will come along that actually won't necessarily actually give you any value in your business as well. You know, they'll be the things that just sort of fly through the keeper. Mm. They'll be interesting for a little cool. while. Yeah, exactly right. So, you know, I, I like to think of those things as toys. You know, they're, they're, they're great fun for a little while, but then they never really take hold or not they moving never the really dial. deliver anything. Exactly right. You don't want to be focusing on those things. So, you know, if you can be really clear about what the what the challenges are that you face, what the opportunities are that you, you see in the market, and then try to keep an eye out or an ear open for things that you think will help with those things. Just focus on those things. Often, often I think um, knowing a bit of the end destination or having a clear, yeah. a clear, as clear a vision as possible helps. You reckon you can help out some of the advisors out there and um, tell them what, what their job's going to look like in five years' time? <laughs> Uh, look, that's a tough one as well. You know, if I rephrase the question, I guess, into will, will technology help advisors or will it sort of challenge advisors in what they do? Could be a way to look at that. Um, you know, as, as where I said do they, earlier, where do they, what do they have an, left after technology starts to take away a lot of the problems that are already there? I'm an optimist, right? So mm-hmm. I, I would say that technology will absolutely be an enabler for advisors going forward. You know, I really passionately believe that. Um, so will it change what advisors do? Yeah, absolutely, because who wants to be rekeying data between different systems in the office? Nobody. Mm. You know, so if technology can solve those sort of problems for me and create more time for me to actually spend talking with my clients, spending with my clients, um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good thing. So, yeah, absolutely, it'll change what advisors do. It'll change what we do. But I think it'll create new opportunities which are, you know, really valuable, really empowering, um, and really interesting for, for advisors. Where do you think the value proposition is going to lie for advisors going forward? In terms of, obviously, there's been quite a breadth of um, value propositions that advisors have gone out to the market with over the yeah. last ten years. Yeah. Um, some had a value proposition that worked ten, fifteen years ago, and it's still working now. Yeah. Others have, have gone out and designed new value propositions where they're more in a coaching framework, where yeah. they're more in, they're really removed themselves from products. Yeah. Um, care to weigh in on that one? I know it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a... I think, to re- I, I think the reality will be there'll, there'll still be lots of different value propositions. Um, but directionally, I think, you know, what's going on at the moment will start to empower advisors that are what I call sort of true advisors and more independent of product. Mm-hmm. It'll actually, I think, um, increase the capability and the sort of power of, of sort of what I describe as a sort of distribution business. So not a, not a product distributor, but mm-hmm. a real distributor or advisor to a client that's agnostic and independent of product. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reason I think that will happen is because I think things like data and analytics and artificial intelligence and things like that will actually make it easier for um, advisors and easier for people like Money Brilliant as well to sort of cut through all of the data and all of the information that's available in the market mm. and actually give people genuine advice. You know, mm. I think today it's actually quite difficult to do that because despite all the advances in the internet and things like that, it's still actually relatively difficult to get your hands on accurate complete standardized data to drive decisions. You know, we talked a little bit about how difficult it is to get superannuation data. Who'd have thought in, you know, 2019, we'd still be struggling to get access to standardized data to drive evaluations around a product like superannuation. But that's, that's the reality. So directionally, you know, that'll get easier. And I think as that gets easier, the value of advice and genuine advice will become even greater. Mm. And so, you know, those sort of businesses, I think that are independent of product will become more powerful, more valuable, you know, more effective. Yeah. I guess like you go, well, as soon as um, it's easy for a consumer to do it themselves, that's your value proposition. Yeah. It's going to be straight. Yeah, I mean, that's true as well. You know, and and I think that will happen. There'll be some, there'll be some advice businesses have value propositions today that will be challenged because um, there'll be some things that consumers will be 
more able to do themselves. Mm. Um, and so, you know, the challenge for all of our businesses, and it's just as applicable to Money Brilliant, is, you know, as things be, as those things at sort of the bottom end become easier mm. and become more automated, you know, we need to sort of move up the up the chain to be doing things that previously were sort of more complex and more valuable yep. because you can't make money out of these things down the bottom anymore because they are automated. Yep. Um, and, you know, that, that, that's the way we look at things, you know, every, every day. How do you go up the value tree? Correct. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Because of the things at the bottom of the value tree eventually get automated. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a good assumption to, to run with. Well, Peter, thank you for coming on. Is there, um, I, I guess if people want to find out more about money, money brilliant, yep. what would you, um, where would you send them? What should they do? Uh, look, the easiest way to, um, to learn a bit more about money brilliant is go to the money brilliant website, um, moneybrilliant.com.au or download the app from one of the app stores and have a bit of a try of it yourself. Um, or give us a call. You know, we're happy to come and talk to people, happy to demonstrate some of the things that we, um, we can do with the platform. I'm happy to demonstrate some of the integration capabilities that we've got um, and really love talking to advisors about, you know, really engaging, really efficient processes that we can build using these sort of technology platforms and some of the integration that we've got. Mm. Well, that's awesome. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.